welcome back to the second session, our second session, Learning from and Regenerating Urban Morphology. Um, as time is costly, I leave it to everyone to introduce themselves briefly. Peter, please. <coughs> I'll switch off the lights, so. Okay, my name is Peter Keller. I'm an architect and a writer. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the Stockholm Charter uh, does not use the word traditional. However, I am going to make the assumption here that what we are most interested in is traditional urbanism. When we talk about the thriving movement towards traditional architecture, we know that we are talking about new architecture that is built as old traditional architecture and draws directly from such designs in creating new designs. When contemporary traditional architects design urban layouts, it would appear that generally they use the same method. That is to say, the architects look at old towns and cities for their urban design or morphology and seek to import its look into the new schemes. I am going to discuss urban design with reference to the Viennese architect, writer and planner Camilo Zitta, whose groundbreaking book City Planning According to Artistic Principles was published in 1889. So the opinions I will be giving, I will be giving you are in the main those of Zitter as expressed in his book Not Necessarily Mine. Uh, I believe, of course, that Zitter's uh, views carry much more weight than my own. What made his book a revelation at its publication was that Zitter shifted the focus of the newly developing discipline of urban planning, away from the practical aspects such as sanitation and circulation, and focused for the first time on the aesthetic qualities of urban design, or as, <coughs> as his translators would have it, artistic qualities. In my talk, like Sitter, I will be discussing only the aesthetic aspect of planning, although it is my belief that if we can get this right, a lot of other things will take care of themselves. A beautiful urban space never goes out of date or becomes dysfunctional, and it never will. And I want to stress at the outset that Zitter, as the title of his book makes clear, wished to establish principles which the present-day urban designer could use to create the undoubted virtues that old cities have. His word, principles, is crucial to his and my argument. There are two theoretical wellsprings to aesthetic urban design. <laughs> Both originated in the late 19th century, and ever since, each has taken the subject in quite a different direction. Zitter's ideas formed one of them, and he discussed mainly, but not exclusively, the, the denser central parts of towns. The other came from Ebenezer Howard, who invented the concept of the Garden City. The Garden City may be much more than an aesthetic concept, but it certainly includes one such. The Garden City still has much currency, as the recent book by Robert A. M. Stern makes clear. In the 1950s, Zitter's themes were taken up by the influential English townscape movement begun by Gordon Cullen and continued by, amongst others, Paul Moraine and his colleagues in the excellent handbook of urban design, Responsive Environments, published in 18, 80, uh, sorry, 1985. And the present concern for what I would call micro-urbanism is in this tradition. Zitter was a writer who was destined to be misunderstood, not because he was not clear, but, be, but for two quite separate reasons. One is that, frankly, people do not bother to read him carefully, and the other is that he suffered the injustice of having an extra chapter inserted into his book by the French translator of 1906, to which I will refer in a moment. Zitter, in his first chapter, makes clear a fundamental principle, which is this. All public open spaces, or 
appliances, as he calls them, are in, in the European tradition throughout history were based on the original classical models, the Greek Agora and the Roman Forum. These ancient spaces were focuses for civil and commercial activity and in a real sense were the heart of the city. To achieve this formally, they were enclosed. For <clears throat> following the establishment of this basic principle, he proceeds with a fascinating explanation of how, of how similar qualities were achieved with the, the so-called organic context of medieval and early Renaissance towns. So persuasive are his arguments in this section that his vital previous discussion of ancient public spaces and his later discussion of Baroque spaces tend to be overlooked. So Sitter is cast as a medievalist, which he certainly was not. Medieval cities are often described as organic, but I prefer to use the more precise and accurate term, accumulative. Here I will draw an important distinction between American and European new urbanism. And for the moment, I am referring only to the Latin. To take what is probably an iconic example of European urbanism, Hungary, it appears that the designers have sought to replicate the effect of an accumulative model. I would suggest there is no principle used in the layout. The, diet, the desire is simply to imitate visually a perceived character of old towns. And there is potentially a problem here. Namely, can the effect of real accumulation in, in an old town be successfully brought to bear on a design that is realised in a single moment? But what exactly does Zitter himself say on the question? On this point, Zitter could not be clearer. He writes, can the accidents of history over the course of centuries be invented and constructed ex novo in the plan? Could one then truly and sincerely enjoy such a fabricated ingenuousness, such a studied naturalness? He replies to his own question, certainly not. The problem is that whereas in an old, in an old building, just like a new one, is normally created by a single designer at a single moment. This is not so of a traditional town. The traditional town is, in almost all cases, <clears throat> made up of different initiatives at different points in history. So does this mean... So does this mean that we should abandon informal in urban design and stick resolutely to formal design? I don't think so. Informal design can work, but it has to be orchestrated. What I mean by this is that the designer cannot aggregate his or her role in the conception and let randomness take over. You cannot fool the observer into believing that an arrangement is accumulative when actually it is not. Orchestrated design does not mean formal or symmetrical design automatically, although it can include those things. It can include variety, but there must be rules so that the experience of it from every angle says orchestrated. Here, in this new scheme by Stanhope Gate Architects, the consistency of construction and materials created in a, in a discipline which the elements can be orchestrated. And orchestration, equally, can be applied to simple formal arrangements. Here, I suggest the clue to a successful orchestration is the sublimation of individual, house, individual units to the whole. The focus is shifted onto the windows as units by a simple but effective moulding. The other mouldings are modest in keeping with the building, but strong enough to orchestrate the whole. The same principle in somewhat grander style can be seen here in Bath. Now, so now we have refuted the suggestion that Zitter was a medievalist and exclusively in favour of crooked or wonky layouts. Let us say what he was advocating in order to create aesthetic urban design. 
Instead of attempting to achieve the charm of old cities by replicating them, we should work from principles. Here, Sitter, as the title of his book makes clear, can help us. I would point to two of Zitter's principles, neither of which suggest either formal or informal layouts. They apply equally to both. The first is enclosure. The types of public open spaces, or plazas as he calls them, that he showed approvingly were either medieval or baroque. Zitter has quite a lot to say about how, how plazas achieve enclosure, and crucial to this was how the streets entered it. Any street coming into a plaza was in danger of blowing open the space. And Zitter cited one simple principle that he had observed in old plazas. This was that, that streets should enter, into, should enter into the plaza in the fashion of what we call a turbine blade. This means that from most positions in the plaza, there was no view out, and so the sense of enclosure was maintained. Clearly, this principle could be achieved equally in a formal or informal layout. Baroque planning, <clears throat> he observed, uses various devices to maintain enclosure. He was particularly fond of the horseshoe plan. This, like all Baroque planning, has the crucial concept of orchestration at its centre. We need to be aware that in talking about enclosure, Zitter was referring to open spaces or plazas. Zitter never advocated crooked streets in order to avoid long vistas. Many people think he did, for the French translation of 1906 inserted uh, into his own book, uh, and I've already referred to this, it shows how enclosure could apply to streets or throughways. And these are illustrations that were inserted into Zitter's book. This chapter persisted in the English tradition, in the English edition, which we still use, and seems to have influenced <coughs> in new urbanism, probably by way of the English landscape <coughs> movement to which I refer, as in this example by Gordon Cullen. Zitter does indicate a way of terminating visitors in the streets when he speaks of the advantage, both practical and uh, aesthetic, of T-junctions over crossroads. Zitter did talk about through routes, although in a different way. This forms the second of the principles of Zitter's that I wish to describe. <coughs> Zitter was resolutely against what he called block planning, and this he saw everywhere around him. What he wished for in his place is what I would call hierarchical planning. With block planning, you set out the private blocks and the space left over is the public space. Now, it might be thought that all urban planning is block planning, for you can shape the block however you want to generate whatever desired uh, public open space that you want. But there's a great difference. With hierarchical planning, you start not from the building blocks, but from the streets or throughways. Certain have prior importance, and then from these are accessed subsidiary streets or passages. Certain have prior importance, and then from these are accessed subsidiary streets or passages. Um, all accumulative urban design exhibits this kind of hierarchy, and when we visit such a town, we immediately read it this way. Now, there is one big impact on the town so organised from the aesthetic point of view. The main routes appear relatively continuous, while the secondary streets are automatically narrower. In this way, the main street gains a sense of enclosure, but it's nothing to do whether it is crooked or straight. I have suggested how Zitter would criticise European new urbanism, but he would also criticise American new urbanism. He would find his principle of creating good enclosed public spaces weak, as here at the iconic American piece of new urbanism, Seaside, as it shows here. American urban design seems to a degree have lost the idea of a strong civic centre that was so important to the earlier American city beautiful movement. 
a truly glorious moment in American history and in the history of urban design that America sadly failed to capitalize on in the longer term. And so we come full circle to the point where Zitta starts. The model of the ancient cities is one we should never lose sight of, with their civic centers, which have, which have been such an enduring element of Western civilization. Thank you. Thank you.